Hello and welcome to the Amateur Football Podcast. I have a very special guest, uh, a former professional footballer and CEO and founder of the Red Card Gambling Support Project, Tony Kelly. How are you doing, sir? Hi, Tabriz. Good to meet you. Yeah, doing very well. Thanks, mate. Very well. Good stuff. Good stuff. So um, let's go straight straight into it. Could you describe your gambling story in one word? Good. That's a good question. I'd say, well, it, one word, like it's hard to describe in one word. Tragic is one word. And one word is um, inspiring as well. So it's, there's two ends to my story. And like, why would you say tragic first? I think tragic because, you know, when you've uh, gone on a gambling journey in terms of having a severe gambling addiction, then it's all the, pe all the people that are impacted around you. So that's part of it. And then obviously the individual loss in terms of, um, you know, losing a house or losing breakdown of relationships, all the issues that come with it, you know, tell a tragic story because obviously some people, you know, we, we call it rock bottom, which is where I went. Um, and obviously for some people, it's, it's even more severe than that. So it's tragic in a sense of everything that I lost along the way, that journey in terms of friends, uh, the financial side and the other issues. Uh, and then obviously, like I said, on the other side, we have an inspiring story, which obviously, as you know, I share because I'm one of the fortunate ones that come out the other side. Mm. So, yeah, there are two parts to my story. So, again, correct me if I'm wrong, at 16, you was the youngest um, ever player to appear for Bristol City at the time. Mm -hmm. um, I would actually love to know your emotions leading up to the game. And, you know, were you expected to, like, come on? And I'd love to know your emotions after the game. Yeah, I think obviously I was 16. Uh, I was an apprentice, Bristol City. And obviously we used to watch the first team. And as a 16 year old back in the 80s and you're watching the first team play um so we'd have our game in the morning and we'd watch the first team in the afternoon ashton gate and obviously when you're a 16 year old and you're, and you're looking at thousands of people in the stadium then it's really really exciting you know and all you all you think to yourself is that one day i want that to be me so when the opportunity came around i was called after training they used to put the um squad upon the notice board uh, and I was in the squad and obviously I was really really surprised um, obviously telling the family and I think it was Hartlepool United if I remember um, away and obviously I remember being on the coach and being really 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 nervous <laughs> really nervous because you know obviously you've got senior senior pros on the coach and the banter and all the rest of it so that that side of it you know, I've never experienced, I've never experienced being in that environment. So it was really nerve wracking. Um, obviously, Terry Cooper, the manager, would, would come down to the back of the coach and just tell him to relax, etc. Um, but then, yeah, leading, so that's partly leading up to going to the, to the ground. And obviously then being in Harlepool Stadium, it wasn't a great stadium, but it's a professional football ground. So it's still huge for me as a 16 year old. Um, and then obviously hoping that I'll get on. Um, and when I did come on, I think one thing I remember, and this was this was similar to when I, when I, I'm sure touching it later when I when I came on from a first appearance for Stoke City years later, but it's a similar experience in terms of getting used to the pace of professional football. I've gone from youth team football to professional football, and it's a completely different ball game. So, yeah, I did find it difficult. But obviously, I can't remember how long I played, twenty minutes, whatever it was. But that was my introduction, and that was my. Dave was a 16 year old, 244 days record that stood for about 20 years. Yeah. So, yeah, really exciting, really proud. And the family obviously were really proud of, of, of what I achieved. Mm. And, you know, I just want to say when you said, you know, let me just remember, I'm not too sure. You you knew exactly where it was, away, you knew the stats. Yeah. So, you know, again, it's something that you're really, really mm. proud of. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and I, I don't know if you're aware, but I think I made eight eight appearances um, as a 16 stroke 17 year old before being released from Bristol City. But you know the other memory of of a, of a 
teenager Bristol City was obviously scoring the first professional goal in, in professional football, which is for Bristol City. So, and I, yeah, and I remember that because my brothers came down for that. That was at Hereford United, 3-1, uh, I think, yeah, and I scored in that night. And that was another milestone in terms of as a, as a young teenager. So, yeah, that, I've had two really, you know, amazing moments as a teenager at Bristol City, which you know, obviously I'll never forget. You've been kind of very open with your footballing career and you know you've like said openly that um you actually should have done better um, mm. i would have i would actually love to know um, what's the worst piece of advice that a manager or coach has said to you the worst piece of advice the worst piece i will i haven't had in the managers that i've played for um I haven't had any real bad advice. I've just had, you know, bad comments. Um, so, you know, comments like, uh, you know, in, ter in terms of in, in terms of uh, criti criticism. So, like, I'd get things like, you know, your week is piss, that kind of thing. So, I've had a few negative comments from managers, but I've never actually had a manager that's actually given me really bad advice. Um, I've had, I've, had, I've actually had, you know, one person that gave me great advice, which is when I left Bristol City, and Clive Middlemass, uh, he's passed away now, but he was Terry Cooper's assistant, and he said to me that, you know, you will, you know, you will become a professional footballer once you sort your head out, and he was exactly right because I was seventeen then, and obviously five years later he was right. You speak about having panic attacks uh, anxiety and depression um i would actually love to uh, get a story from like you um which which one of those um symptoms or, or i mean it's kind of very hard to kind of even categorize you know categorize, yeah. mm. you know categorize but um what what can you remember came first in your own personal life story? I think the, 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 well, I've, I've only, to be honest with you, really sort of over the years recently learned about what anxiety feels like um, and panic attacks, etc. And I think, you know, when I was going through at the height of the addiction, when obviously I'm in serious debt, um, relationship breaking down, uh, poor performance on the field, uh, not wanting to go training, missing training sometimes and lying. So all these things that are going on ar around me as I'm going through this journey, you know, culminated in me starting to not feel very well, but I didn't really know what it was. I knew that I was down. I didn't really understand what depression is. But all I know is that I wanted to be on my own. Um, I became withdrawn. Didn't want to see anybody. Uh, didn't want to. So we'd have players nights out. You know, I wasn't interested. So that's that's now now I'm starting to understand about you know withdrawal symptoms of not being around and feeling isolated. Uh, and I think one time I was in my house in Stoke on Trent, and I was just sitting down as normal watching TV. Um, and then all of a sudden I felt I felt really really dizzy, and it felt like I was going to pass out. And then my heart rate was going under mile an hour and I didn't really know what was happening. And uh, so I got up as quick as I could to the front door and opened the front door and got outside into the fresh air. This was about 10 o'clock at night. Uh, once I got outside into the fresh air and sat down on the pavement um, in the drive, I started slowly, slowly to, to come back down. And I was wondering what the hell was that? You know what I mean? Because I've, I've never had that feeling before. Um, and obviously that's when I was diagnosed with anxiety and that's when I was put on, I think they called them beta blockers back then, um, you know, to cope with my anxiety. And obviously the anxiety stems from what I was going through and in terms of constantly having these thoughts in my head about, you know, how can I pay the bills? How am I going to get out of this? You know, what bailiffs are turning up for what? Um, do I have to go into training and think about Saturday's match in terms of my mental state? You know, am, am I... Because sometimes... I'd look ahead to a game on a Saturday and, and I wouldn't actually feel like 
playing or sometimes I'd hope that I wasn't un- I wasn't in the squad. And I remember that clearly. There'd be times where I'd hope because obviously, you know, the, the, the team sheet would go up on Friday or, or announce a squad that's travelling on the Saturday. And sometimes I'd hope that I wasn't involved. And sometimes I was happy that I wasn't involved because I just couldn't cope with the pressure of going to play another match, whoever it's against, uh, in the state of mind that I was in. So it's really, really strange. I would let, love to know, um, what was your first bet? The first bet was when I was 18, when I moved to London from Coventry. Um, so obviously released at Bristol City, 17 and a half. Um, and that was obviously a shock. And then I went to move to London to sort of basically move to London to live with my sister and, and basically have a different life, basically, you know, recharge back to start again. And I signed for Dulwich Hamlet, non league football club in South East London. Uh, and that's where I had my first bet across the road. I'll never forget it, Mecca Bookmakers, um, which is where the, the, the older players used to go to have their bets before before the match on a Saturday. Um, and I, was, I remember it was five away and I didn't win. Uh, but yeah, that was the start of introduction into gambling in terms of um, mainstream gambling, and obviously that was that was partly because I wanted to um, fit in with the crowd and fit in with a click of players, and that was my way of sort of having a sense of belonging. Coming from Coventry, you know, young, shy, uh, that was my way of sort of fitting in with with a group of lads, and that's how the sort of gambling uh, started from then on. And um... Were you gambling on horses, football? Yeah, was it the it was, fruit machines? Yeah, it was all football then. The, the, uh, the early years of my gambling was all about football, football coupons, um, home and aways, etc. It was all about football coupons. Mm. It was only later that involved in all the, all the other uh, different aspects of gambling. But yeah, it was all football to start with. Mm. And you, again, openly talk about how if you kind of won on a, on a, on a huge bet, you know, you would actually perform absolutely amazing on the pitch. And if you lost a bet, you know, you would literally fear about your performance. I mean, how how kind of crippling was that on a on a kind of daily basis? And and that training, um, could you? I mean, it's kind of easy to actually say now, but you know, were there any teammates that would have kind of um, pull you aside and say, Tony, what's what you know what's kind of going on um with you today yeah well I, I never in all the clubs i was at i never once spoke to any teammates uh, about my gambling um and i never had any i was never asked once by any manager about the gambling so in terms of you know my, my feelings going into pitch and training etc yeah it was always my mindset my mental state was always up and down um, so, you know, there'd, there'd be times where if I'd had a bad week, and, you know, and I'm, I'm feeling down and anxious and a little bit depressed and we're coming to the weekend, um, generally more, most of the time uh, I wouldn't perform because of my mental state and because of the way I was. There'd be times where I'd be preoccupied with gambling within my head, which means that basically I would be thinking about, you know, what bets may, may or may not come in today. So I'm not really focusing on the game. I'm thinking about, you know, what gambling bets I'll put on and are they going to come in? It might be a case that next week's mortgage is due, I've got to win this Saturday. So those kind of thoughts are going through my head. Uh, and, that's, and that's how my sort of my mindset was. Obviously, it wasn't every single time, but that's the majority of the time. And, and I think when I look back at my career, that's why I say I could have done more because I, would, my, I think it's only Berry where I was very, very consistent in terms of playing. Whereas all the other clubs, it's always been a sporadic form. And it's always been in and out the side because uh, I could never get to the level where the mental state was right uh, and I felt good about myself where I could you know, perform on a regular basis at a high level. It was always, as I said, sporadic form. So, yeah, it's just the way for some people, you know, for others, it can be, you know, going onto a football pitch or cricket pitch or darts, whatever it is, because obviously, as we know, gambling's in all sports. Um, it can be a form of escapism for some people, and they tend to play well. You know, once they get into that arena, uh, but for others, yeah, it has the opposite opposite impact. And for me, I was one of those. Do, do you think you have a 
and a, an addictive personality? Well, we we spoke to therapists, and <laughs> psychotherapists, etc., and that um, there is something about addictive personality um, because people are going to get addicted to absolutely anything, whether it's shopping, sex, or gambling, or drugs, or absolutely anything. So, um, I would I wouldn't say that I've got an addictive personality personally. Um, it's a very difficult difficult thing to weigh up because it goes deeper in terms of you know the way we're wired up in terms you know. Um, you know, the neuroscience of gambling, the dopamine, the brush, all that kind of stuff. So it gets, it can get very deep in terms of the biological side. So some people, that's why we say some people can, you know, spend 20, 30 quid a week and never chase money and never be bothered, you know, never encounter any gambling harm. I uh, can do it socially responsibly, never ever get, get into trouble. But others, you know, will have a tendency to, to chase money, uh, to want more, so we're all different so the, the addictive personality thing you know there's something to be said about it there are people out there as, as our therapist has said a red card that you know do have an addictive personality but yeah i wouldn't say i'm one of them to be honest yeah okay um and again thank you so much for like sharing you you've um you know openly said that you've lost probably is it half a million pounds and yeah that's over a nine-year period yeah um and i think that's that's obviously wages and uh, a house and obviously um you know when you when you sign for clubs i think i've had three transfers i think you know and that's the that's the other crazy thing is that when we have when you know as you might or might not aware of people listening that when you go to a football club or have a transfer to a football club yes there's a transfer fee between the clubs but the player gets a sign on fee um and i remember signing for berry from from stoke yeah stoke to bury um and i got fifteen thousand pound and this is 1993 um but i i didn't have to go to bury the, the clubs agreed a fee but it was down to me whether i went to bury or not so down to me whether i'm dropping into league league two um where really i should you know i should have sat tight you know continued with the rest of my contract you know maybe get a new contract stay at that level um but, but i'll sign for berry simply because of the fifteen thousand pound and, and the ways they're giving me and that and that was mainly because obviously from a gambling addict and i want to clear some debts or i want to carry on gambling because in my head i'm thinking fifteen thousand pounds there's a lot of money back then mm. so that's probably equivalent to about three or four hundred thousand pounds today mm. so yeah three transfers um all the signing on fees i've had um the wages and obviously the house so yeah it's accumulated to over half a million pound yeah and and also as well you like filed for bankruptcy um well, yeah mm. when was that moment where like you had to tell you know like your, like your partner your parents your your siblings about um your kind of uh, gambling addiction yeah um my daughter my daughter's um 14 or 13. um the only person that i told was straight away was my twin brother uh, so i didn't tell the rest of the family until it was all done um but in terms of how i felt at that time i was quite strangely enough quite excited to the fact that i got my bankruptcy accepted because you have to file for bankruptcy and i think it cost about 600 pound at the time uh, because all I wanted to do was get rid of the debt, get rid of the stress of phone calls and bailiffs knocking the door and cars repossessed, uh, default letters, all the, all those things that come with serious financial harm. And I, you know, once I got it approved that they were going to approve the bankruptcy and I was going to the high court, my brother came with me and it was a £192,000 bankruptcy file with close to 30 creditors uh, that included you know including pawnbrokers and love book loans you name it all kinds of um sources of borrowing and uh yeah and i remember we came out out of the uh high court and it was a massive massive relief i can't stress how much it was a massive relief and a big weight off my shoulder knowing that the hundred ninety thousand pound debt is now clear knowing i'm not going to get any more uh, letters or bailiffs or phone calls 
and we, I remember going for a drink, and I remember <laughs> getting, quite, getting quite smashed actually, me and my brother, because it was it was a, it was a celebratory drink in in, in a sense, um, because obviously I did I did feel really relieved. So that was I suppose the start of a slow road to recovery, because obviously, um, you know, I couldn't get credit anymore, so I couldn't have the resources to gamble. Uh, I think it was a maximum five hundred pound you could get. Um, yeah, and um, so that was that was I suppose yeah that was the start of me sort of thinking right okay, you know you've got all your debt cleared now it's a question of you know can you focus can you try and rebuild your life basically um, yeah. and slowly it did but other factors came into play that that helped me along that journey. Mm. Um, did you ever relapse or were there any kind of moments of vulnerability where you know? Um, where like you know you wanted to do something um that you knew wasn't right uh i, I wouldn't say the, the relapse is probably the wrong word because i was still gambling even though obviously I, I just wasn't gambling on a bigger scale that's all i was at network rail at the time yeah so wages were decent at network rail so i hadn't curbed the curbed the gambling addiction it's just that i got rid of my debt but obviously in terms of getting accumulating more serious debt that wasn't possible because i didn't have um access to funds apart from my wages uh so i was still gambling um i'd say that it was slowed down a bit i'd say um but i was still gambling right up to right up to the time when i went public in 2014. that's that's when it's stopped when, when i went public because obviously that's a, a different ball game when you know, on going public to the nation, um, which I don't know if you want to touch upon that in terms of where how that occurred. Yeah, I, yeah. Actually, I would actually love to know why you de decided to actually go like public. Yeah, well, it was 2013, and um, my we were there was a couple of stories that came out in the press from um, what I remember one clearly was Michael Chopra. He's paid for it, switch in Sunderland, and he had a gambling problem. And he he put something out there, and then one or two others. So my sister said, oh, why don't you write a book? Or why don't you put your story to print? And I, and I said, well, I wouldn't know where to start. So she's a head teacher in London. And she said, look, just turn it into a biography. Um, starting nine years old, growing up in Coventry, going through the racism, going through amateur um, scholarship expenses, football with Bristol City, getting released, and then obviously turning pro and going through the addiction. So... Um, I wrote, I think it was half a chapter with A4 paper, uh, biro, no computer, <laughs> no, no ghostwriting, no that nonsense. <laughs> I mean, just, just A4 paper, trusted biro. Um, and the thing is, when I started writing, I just could not stop writing. Um, and I believe there's a reason for that, which is which came three years earlier, but we'll, I'll tell you that in a minute. Um, but I just could not stop writing. So day and night, through the night, two, three in the morning, I write and write and write. And it took me 18 months to finish uh, the manuscript with A4 paper, which was up here by then. And I told my sister that, you know, Patricia, I've actually finished it. And then she said, that's amazing. And she said, I'll just, um, she had a few things came around and looked, went through bits of it. And then she said, right, you need to um, send it to publishers online. So obviously, you know, we, we, there has to be a beginning and an end of the synopsis of the story. So we did it online to different publishing companies and then got got quite a bit re few replies. Uh, a couple in America, but we thought, no, we'll keep, keep it in England. And then, yeah, um, it was published um, in 2014, on, obviously on Amazon, etc. cetera. And I remember, I remember the day that I got a parcel through the post with 15 free copies for family and friends from the publisher. And when I picked the book up, that's when I realized how, how did this happen? How did I become an author? You know, this is going to be out there. And I just couldn't quite believe it. Um, and before I go on to what happened when the book came out was published in terms of going public, um, there was you know, a situation that happened to me in 2010, 9 to 10, uh, 
which is at the same time as the bankruptcy and the same time as the breakup of my 20 year relationship and, the, and obviously the, in the midst of my addiction. So I was at um, Network Rail, as I said, and I was in my signal box uh, in uh, southwest, south, northwest London, in Dulles Hill. And I had a knock on the door on a Sunday afternoon. And remember, I'd been there 10 years at the time and didn't recognize this individual at the door. And old guy, about 50, he said he's the network rail local chaplain. So I said, well, I've been here 10 years and I've never had a visit from a, from a network rail local chaplain. So I said, have you got any ID? And he said, yep, yeah, showed me his ID. And he said, your signal box has come up as a regional visit. So it didn't make sense to me because I've been there 10 years, but he showed me his ID and, and, he, and he had a brand new Bible with him. Hmm. So when he came in and we sat down, we, we basically talked for two hours about my life, about what's happened, about where I am at this present moment in time and about where you want to be in the future. And then he wrote out this prayer on a white paper, which I now know is a salvation prayer. And I've got it to this day. And I'll tell you about that in a minute, but I've got it to this day. And it wasn't a case that when he left after two hours that things changed or my life changed or anything like that. But it, what, what happened is that when I got back home and all that and told the family and stuff, um, my sister and my mum were very, very religious. And they said, it's a sign. And they said, you know, just try and get closer to the God and, and try and read a few scriptures. And so I started to do that and read some Psalms and different scriptures, etc. Uh, and started to sort of grow my Christian faith a bit. So that's why I say three years later, when I had that opportunity to go public with the book, that's why I say that that's part of what God was putting in place, in in my opinion and in my you know belief, uh, because I don't know how I managed to write a book and get published. And then the next big step, as, as you mentioned, was to go public onto, onto uh, national TV. So with the publisher came um, a media assistant, so obviously you know there was a lot of interest so i went on talk sport um obviously radio five live and a few other stations and then obviously the big one was bbc breakfast mm -hmm. and i think you know for, for me to have well, well god was in my life then for about three to four years so for me to have the confidence the courage the strength to be able to go on national tv and share my story is another thing that i think wow how did you actually manage to do that and and everyone said it was absolutely amazing. And I think the one thing that came out of that, which is um, probably the most biggest message that came out of that was the fact that I realised, you know, just through the feedback from emails, etc., was the fact that I realised that I'm not alone and that this is impacts thousands and thousands of people across the UK. Mm -hmm. So that was the start of the recovery in terms of gambling because it came out done all the media stuff and then it then sister said what do we do what do you want to do next and that's when the mention of set up a company was mentioned and i i again i don't have no degrees etc i don't know how to set up a company it seemed to be it seemed to be quite smooth it, it didn't seem difficult to get a corporate company incorporated and decide you know what we're going to call it and what we're going to do and then lots of people came on board so it's as if God just sent loads of people to me to help set up and Red Card was born in 2000, late 2014 um, as a CRC company. So all of a sudden, I'm now a published author and I'm now a founder, I'm now a CEO, and I'm just thinking, this is incredible. Um, and so that's that's how all the recovery started. And so I was using wages to, because um, obviously we, at, the, at the start of the Red Card, project you have to get funding that takes time you have to get established and get directors on board and all the rest of it so i was funding it myself so the money that i might have gambled with i would use to buy things and materials and get a laptop and all different things so uh, there was a massive shift but in between the in between setting up red card and writing a book yeah just af after i've written the book and went public uh in between that i did have about 
it was between, I can't remember exactly, between two and three months counselling. Mm -hmm. um, and the counselling was private counselling, but the counselling wasn't just about the gambling. The counselling was about the gambling, but it was also about you know the future and hope and where I want to be in five years. Uh, how can I change my life? So I always say to people about recovery is different for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's three aspects in my recovery, which is counselling, my faith, and the family support. So they're the three things that helped me recover after set up Red Car Gambling Sport Project 2014 stroke 15. Wow. Wow. I've got so many questions. I've got yeah. so many... I bet you have. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay, I'll, I'll be slightly controversial here. I mean, do you think there's, there's ever such thing as a responsible gambler? Good question, that is. Good question. Responsible gambler. Because, because when we, it's funny, when we look at these messaging today, for instance, and gamble responsibly, um, it depends what people's definition of respons responsible is. Uh, because some people will gamble, but they, they, they are not, they don't have the capacity be because of who they are or the environment or whether they're, um, vulnerable or depending on the, the demographics they come from or where they live, you know, are not capable of being responsible for, for those reasons. So not everybody can be responsible. Um, and when you look at people that, cause I've got friends that do have a bet on a weekly basis. Um, and whether you call that gambling responsibly or whether it's just doing something in moderation, what people say, people can do stuff in moderation um there could be something said for that because you know these people or people that i know and, and in the workshops that we do and we talk to people they say yeah i have a bit of a week every 20 no problem um if they never encounter gambling harm in their life as they go along their journey then that 10 or 20 pound that they spend every saturday whatever it is with their mates is social is fun and yeah, I suppose you could call it that they're being responsible. So answer to your question, I'll probably say there there is an element of being responsible, you know, if you're participating in, in gamble, because obviously you're you're responsible for your actions, you're responsible for whatever outcomes that brings. What why do you think it's mostly men um that actually gamble? I mean, again, I've, I've yeah, kind yeah. of looked on the stats and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, but but like yeah. saying it's you know, it's around 65 66 of, of you know of like men that actually were taking in like gambling yeah so where we were back in the day you know this the, the gambling environment or industry whatever you want to call it um the gambling landscape it was predominantly male yeah that's how it was back from the 70s upwards throughout my career going into the bookmakers i didn't see no women uh, and obviously online gambling wasn't around in the, in the 90s so that period was dominated by, you know, probably, I don't know, 90, 95% male gambling. <laughs> now that the landscape of whole gambling has changed, we're now in a position where I think there was a stat from Gambler Aware where there's more women that have seeked treatment for that Gambler Aware in 2022 than men. Uh, there's a massive rise in women gambling and we've worked with some of the women there's lots of focus groups with women um lots of different reasons why women are gambling um and part of that obviously the main part of it is due to the introduction of online gambling so uh of you know i've worked with many many lived experienced women uh, that have suffered serious gambling harms so you, you know in terms of what you're saying about why it's men we've, it's sort of very very slowly and close to balancing out uh, that's where we are today um so yeah there's been a huge shift uh, in women gambling and um when you could have watched a, you know like prim, uh, premier league uh, championship league one or even league like two there's mm. always either a betting hoarding or there's an advert or yeah or there's something you know um is it is it just a cultural thing that betting and football have to go hand in hand um i say i say that in terms of the advertising promotion not so but in terms of actual you know 
footballers and gambling. That has always been the culture. And that goes back to the Rugby Marsh and George Best days. So gambling and football players has always been, um, you know, there's always been that correlation between football players and gambling. So um, right through my nine years, you know, massive culture of gambling, team buses, card schools at the back of the school. And I think that's one thing that, if there's one thing that stands out about the participation of gambling with myself and, and teammates at various clubs that I've been at, is that card schools, when you're going away for four hours in the back of the coach or if you're staying in a hotel, so whether it's in a hotel room or whether it's in the back of the coach, that stands out. The reason why it stands out, not necessarily because players lost you know, a lot of money, which, which happened, um, and obviously, you know, the thought of coming off the coach and losing a couple of grand or even three or four hundred quid and then having to go and play football, you know, that that is um, hard to take, but that's what used to happen for some players. Or IOUs, write a little IOU out, I'll give you next week. So this, and I've had feedback from lots of ex-players since I've been around this place now about, you know, I had it, I had it bad back then, but they didn't talk about it. But the, the thing that stood out about that particular, you know, part of, of gambling where players are gambling on the coach was the fact that managers and chairmen and directors used to come down and join in. And that's the bit, that's the really, really scary bit. So that's how normalised it was. That's how normalised it was that the, the coaches and the managers and the, and the directors, they didn't think about if someone suffering gambling harm, they just came to the, because they wanted to join in and have a bet as well. So that's culturally, that's how it was. It was so normal. Um, so where we are today is different. That would obviously never happen today. But, you know, going to the point of advertising, I've worked with the um, Gambling Commission for nine months on, on the advisory board, 2022. And one of the things was the discussion around gambling advertising and football. And as you rightly said, we are saturated with it. So, you know, it's whether it's whether it's shirt sponsorship or whether it's stadia betting or whether it's perimeter, perimeter fencing, it's absolutely everywhere. Um, and my sort of take on it is that football will always, always survive without gambling sponsorship. It always has done and it always will do. You know, I think probably the most biggest, if we're talking about, I don't know, Man United or something, is the biggest sort of sponsorship dealers around five or six million. You know, it's, it's pennies compared to, you know, it's pennies to these big Premier League clubs. So it's not a massive part of their revenue. So they don't need it. If they, if a football, if an operator, for argument's sake, Stoke to bet three to the side, dropped out as a sponsorship, you know, there'll always be someone, you know, not related to football that would be happy to sponsor a big football club. Um, the, the, you know, the revenue might not be the same, but the club's going to survive. Uh, so, and I think the dangerous part of the whole of this gambling advertising on football is how it encourages young people. And, you know, we've spoke to, we work with a lot of young people, a lot, which is the main source, source of our work. And, you know, the majority are in agreement that obviously they're tempted when they see the free bets. Um, and obviously you've got people that are, are more vulnerable. You've got people that live in poverty in areas of deprivation who will obviously clearly see these adverts, etc., and think that, yeah, £20 free bet, £50 free bet um, is this opportunity to win some money. So the draw and the encouragement of it is really, really dangerous. Um, and I think that, you know, when you talk about the actual operators themselves who spend huge amounts of money on marketing revenue, they're... they're, they're their resources in terms of marketing is huge. They spend a lot of their money on marketing because they know uh, they're fully aware that, you know, they're going to reach tens of thousands of people and, and people are going to uh, sign up to their gambling app. So, you know, I, I, I can't, I can't, I would say I can't actually blame a business for marketing to a certain audience. You know, I think it's down to the government um, to decide, you know, how much marketing can be done and the scale of marketing and what that marketing you know, advertising looks like because it's all if we go that's one side the football sponsorship and the correlation between football and gambling that's one side of gambling advertising and then you've got the standard general gambling advertising that's on our tv screens mm -hmm. so 
what we haven't seen, and this is what we were discussing with the um, DCMS and the Gambling, Gambling Commission, is we don't see safer gambling messaging. We only see people winning, people happy. You know, the William Hill advert, um, which, you know, we use in our, in our promos, is, is, is a classic example of different demographics, you know, men and women, gender, uh, places where they gamble, whether it's in the bookies, whether it's in the pub, whether it's in the barbers, whether it's a casino, all these places are shown, all these people are shown, everybody's happy, everybody's winning. And so that's just a classic example of how gambling advertising is portrayed on our TV screens. But there is, we, we will never see, I'll be amazed if we see, you know, parents standing over their son's graveside or a person just being released from prison or a person just um, becoming homeless. So we'll, I'll be amazed if we see those images on our TV screen related to a gambling advert. I would like, love to get your take regarding the Ivan Tony conversation that had with, that he had with Stephen Bartlett and um, also the documentary that Paul Merson did about his gambling addiction. I mean, the, the Ivan Tony one's slightly different because um, I haven't listened to all of it, but I'm, I'm not sure if he's opened up to or whether, whether he was, you know, colluded to say that he's got a, 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 he was a gambling addict or was it just that he was obviously after financial reward and got caught out by you know breaching the rule he ate whatever it is um so you know if he, if he was a a gambling addict and it was coming from you know from him opening up as an individual and talk about it openly and being honest and transparent then there would have been things that maybe he would have talked about how it's impacted on his life, you know, his kids, family, all the, all the other things that come with gambling addiction. So I don't know if he's gone into detail about that, you know, because when you, yeah, as a gambling addict, they're, they're all the things that you, that would, that would, you come along with that journey. So it might be a case that they, in terms of protecting him, in terms of, um, for want of a better word, just making it, safe passage for him in the future get some help in pfa go on a course whatever it is you know yeah we're going to pfa will say we're going to support him whatever yeah put him a little course and that's it uh, he's got a problem with gambling but he, he, that may not be the case but then again we may so i don't know if he's a, if he was an actual gambling addict and it was this was going on for years and years and years hmm. or, or was it just um gambling in a, in a way where you you think you're going to make money but you've been caught out I mean, the poor, mm, yeah. oh, sorry. So yeah, so uh, so my my like biggest takeaway from that conversation, and again, I'll be absolutely honest. Yeah. I just felt that he was trying to pull the wool over people's eyes. He mm. was he was contradicting himself constantly, mm. saying you know you know he didn't know he wasn't allowed to bet, but his brother would put bets on, mm. uh, and and it just felt like he wasn't admitting that he had an an issue a problem i don't know what the right terminology mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. uh and you know again it just felt as if he was he was just on screen because his pr or you know his team said he mm -hmm. should be on i don't think he personally wanted to actually talk about it it was very yeah. you know like it just seemed like a very uncomfortable situation and and like that's be, that's the word i'd use because i've watched it it, it just it feels uncomfortable yeah it feels very uncomfortable yeah yeah definitely uh so you know i don't i just i just i just wish i knew if 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 he actually had a had a proper addiction if it impacted his whole life in all many 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 different ways that's all um but he hasn't elaborated on that so yeah mm. Tricky one. The Paul Merce one slightly different uh, because obviously he does, he is open about how it's impacted on his life and how it's impacted the kids and, and, and the ex-wife and living in a rented accommodation and all these things. So he's been very, very, very open and transparent about it. And I think, you know, Paul's probably one of the, you know, first or whatever, you know, myself and three or four of those that have been really open publicly. And I think it really helps, you know, when, when people are listening to, 
you know, people's individual stories and testimonies because it, it does raise awareness. Um, yeah, and that's what I like about, you know, Paul's testimony that he is really open and honest. And you can see just by his, his reactions, you can see um, it's, it's still slightly impacting him today. Um, so, yeah, I think Paul Paul's done a lot in terms of um, raising awareness of gambling hours, obviously, for, particularly in football. Yeah. When was the last time you cried? That's a great question. Because the reason why this is a great question is because it goes back to how faith is a big part of my journey. So with the work that I do, so we have the Red Car Project, as you know, which is educating people across England and young people. But I also do personal talks to different organisations from time to time when people contact me. And I did an article in a Christian magazine about four months ago called New Life. And it's about inspiring stories. So the guy ran me up, we had a chat, then we did emails. And then he said, I want you to come, I want you to come to our church. And, and I said, oh, where, where's the church? He said, Wales. I was like, what? <laughs> 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 I was not around the corner then. All right, okay. So I said, go to Wales. Because, yeah, and he was a lovely guy, you know, Pastor Rob Jones. And I said, look, you know, we've, we've read the, this week's edition of New Life. I've, I've printed your story. I've edited your story in there. People have come back to me and they need to see you. So I thought, bloody hell, wow. So I thought, yeah, I thought, great. So we set up a date um, and the date was on Sunday, just gone. So we went to Wales. Me and my partner went to Wales uh, to Ellen Brecon Church, 150 congregation, beautiful church. Um, and uh, so I spent half an hour sharing my story to the congregation, which is on YouTube now. And the question, the answer to your question is that halfway through the story, we get to the bit where how has God intervened in my life? You know, when did God intervene in my life? And we get to the point about the network rail story, and we get to the point about the salvation prayer that I actually kept from 2009. And I've got it with me in the church, scribbled, but still read it clearly. Because at the bottom, the last words that he put on that salvation prayer the very last words was now be now now be arranged to get baptized now arranged to get baptized that's what it says and that was 2009 so eight years later the baptism happened um but obviously he was putting all those things in place before 2017 june the 7th 2017 when i got baptized so when it came to that point when you're you know, if you're a Christian or you've got a strong faith or, or whatever faith it is, uh, depending on your relationship with God and how he, how he touches you, because there are certain times where God touches me and I know he's there, and that was one of them. So I cried for about a minute. Took, obviously, the place is silent. And I said, I'll just take a break. And you'll see that if you get to see on YouTube. Um, and it is powerful because I know I'm in God's house. And I know that this is the moment where God intervened. And then I tell the rest of the story. Amazing. Amazing. Mm -hmm. What are your hopes and dreams um, for the next, let's say, five to ten years? And where can people find you and information about your, your charity as well? I think I want to leave a legacy in terms of, you know, red card being uh renowned for education awareness because we have lots of different organizations in the space we have we have the gamble awareness and gamble gam, gam care for treatment and uh, research um but we are starting to be one of the leadings in terms of education awareness because we believe education is key because gambling is going to be here forever uh, past our lifetime um it's only going to grow so we need to continue to educate and early intervention is key as far as we're concerned, which is why we do schools. So I want, to, I want that to stay. So when I've passed through this earth, I want Red Card to be around and whoever takes it, takes it over um, and, and continue the you know, education awareness. Um, 
so it's accessible accessible for for people in, in years and years to come so that's what my hopes and dreams are for red card um obviously i want to continue you know raising awareness and sharing my story because i love sharing my story and i remember the first i'll just go back to one the, the first time i ever shared my story was in 2015 in a coventry business gala dinner um the book had come out a friend of mine in coventry said oh we've got a speaker down um would you your books come out now just spend 10 50 minutes sharing your story 200 people 10 people to a table business gala dinner and i remember when when she asked me my heart sank because obviously i've never ever done any public speaking whatsoever or anything like that or share my story so i remember doing and thinking to myself we had a family of 10 so i got support from my brothers and mum and sister and that and after that tour, I just remember the, how it resonated with so many people and all the people who came up to me afterwards, brothers and sisters, mums and dads, oh, my brother's got this, my sister's got that, blah, blah. And I thought, wow, this is touching so many people. So that was the start of, the, of me getting out there into the community and sharing my story. So I want to continue to do that. I want to continue to do it in churches as well. Um, yeah, so we are everywhere, really. We're on TikTok, the website. We have... All our projects um, and all information is on the website, which is www.redcardgambling.org. Um, obviously, my email is tony at redcardgambling.org. That's tony at redcardgambling.org. And as I said, all the contact details on the website. We are on um, LinkedIn and Facebook and TikTok. Oh, yeah, and Instagram as well. So, red card are everywhere. So, I'm not hard to find. <laughs> I'm not hard to find. So, we are out there on all the social media platforms and yeah if you could if you google tony kelly gambling you'll get about 30 40 pages so yeah i'm not i'm not hard to find but the main and thing for me is that we continue doing what we're doing uh, with care with red card and, and raising awareness of problem gambling because it's going to be here for a long long time to come yeah and all of your information will be in the description below before we go so you know you see, you scored a goal against my club Liverpool. Oh, I knew mean, oh, we get to that. You know, what I mean? and you know, but see, like when I was looking at the replay, it looked like the ball bobbled before you hit it. So, like, it looked like a bit of a miss hit. So, I, I don't know. Like, could you kind of talk us through that goal? You yeah. Know? <laughs> and I've been to I've been to Stoke. Um, I think four times. I think twice at Victoria Ground and twice at, at Britannia. So I've been asked back four times. Um, I think 2018 was the last time where we were talking about red card stuff. I've been at Sterling Mac so Sandy Matthew Suite, sharing my story, you know, pre-match hospitality and just uh, spending 15, 20 minutes with the sports. And obviously this goal always comes up. And I still get loads and loads. I get loads of messages on social media about best night of their lives. I've got guys that are now in their fifties that were ten then and saying, "Oh, it's the biggest day of their life." So, it's great history for for, for me and, uh, and as as a Stoke player and for Stoke Sports. But the night two two at Anfield, um, as you know, Ian Rush Ian Rush scored two, and uh, you know we had six and a half thousand Stoke fans behind the goal, goal packed out, and eighty eighth minute, Lou Macari sends me on, and and I remember the ball clipped down the channel. Mm -hmm. And Gary Ablett, God bless him, he's left us as well. Um, me and him got into a sort of chase. Um, I managed to, I think he's slightly stiff, but I managed to get past him. I did have pace. And I'm in on goal. Now, this is the bit where I've actually said it in, this, in the Sentinel, uh, the Stoke newspaper, um, that my, my objective is I'll, I'll go to the side. My objective mm -hmm. is to side foot it to Grobelar's left. Yeah. But I side foot and I make good connection, but it just goes straight through his legs. So I can honestly say, <laughs> not need to put it through his legs. <laughs> so there you go. But hey, you you know, but it's the way, it's the way, yeah. But the way I've struck it and, and sort of clean it, to a lot of people, it looks like he's not made club enough. It's like looks like I've placed it through his legs. <laughs> but like I say. A goal is a goal, and obviously the whole place went mental beyond that goal. And it's good to do it for the state fans. That's amazing. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Tony Kelly, uh, thank you so much for like coming on. And again, anyone uh, that's been watching, and um, and also people who have been 
affected, please go and click everything that's in the description below. My name is Sabrice. Thank you for watching the Amateur Football Podcast. I'll see everyone soon. Can I finish with one thing? Okay, yeah. Yeah, one thing just to let you know the story, because people might not obviously not 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 everyone's gonna get be able to hear my story in person. But if they want to read the story, then red card, I bet you can win, is out there at uh, William Hill, Waterstones and Amazon, etc. I think, yeah. Um, if you want to read my story, then yeah, Christmas is coming up. Why not? And if you want to sign personally, if you want to sign personally, then just get in touch with me. Yeah. And, Which and is been amazing. Yeah. Thank you. And literally, everything's going to be in the description below. Everything's going to be there. And and again, I just want to say we will be talking about your like book probably in the next week or so. So this is not going to be the last conversation. Excellent. Really enjoy it, mate. Really enjoy it. I really appreciate it. Let me, let me come on your platform. You're welcome. You're welcome. Please like, subscribe, and I'll see everyone later on. See you, mate.